Good morning, good morning. You guys were almost in for a special treat this morning because I had made a typo on the very first slide and normally the first slide is also the image that's on your bulletin and the first one it said, it said, Walkling in the Light. And for a moment I thought, maybe I can change Walkling like, like an Earthling, like a Walkling, like you're Walkling. And I decided no, it's just best to change the whole thing. We had already printed the bulletin, so we had to reprint them all. So there you go. Today we're going to be talking about walking in the light. No, I've, I've been focusing the last several weeks, and uh, actually next week uh, Mitchell Snow is going to come and preach, and he said, what have you been talking about the last uh, several weeks? You're on a series, you're on a theme. And I said, really the main theme is, what does it mean to be a Christian? That has really been the theme for the past several months, is when we say, I'm Christian, what is it we're saying? What is it that people should come to expect from someone who says, I'm Christian? And for a while, in most of my life, it always seemed to come down to a list of doctrines and teachings, and you got to get all your ducks in a row, and you got to get this right, and 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 you got to have all these things right, and that meant I'm a Christian. But that's really not, I believe, what it means to be a Christian, because Christianity is not a list of things to believe. Christianity is a way of life. And actually, in Acts, it was referred to as the way. It was a way of life. It was a way of being in the world. So this morning, I want to talk about what it means to walk in the light. We've talked about what it means to enter through the narrow gate. I want to talk about what it means to walk in the light. And I want to start in an unusual place. Day one, because if you look at Genesis 1, you look at the creation story, I believe that we can find an example in the story itself of what it means for us to walk in the light, to walk in the light. And day one, if you remember the creation story, if not, it's in Genesis chapter one. You can read it after service. Don't read it now because then you'll stop paying attention. Genesis chapter one, we start off with a world that's full of darkness and chaos. There's no life, there's no being, there is nothing really there at all. There's water and darkness and chaos, and it says the Spirit of God is brooding upon the waters, and then God says, let there be light. So in our creation story, the very first thing God does is speak light into darkness. So what does it mean for us to walk in light? Day chapter, day chapter two, day two, still in chapter one. God puts a rakia in the sky. He puts this dome, this vaulted dome in the sky and it separates the waters from the waters. Remember the very first day, there's just waters of chaos everywhere. And then God separates the waters from above from the waters beneath and creates some space. Because in order for you to have life and light and brightness, you need some space for things to live in. And so he creates space. And then in day three, he creates dry ground in that space. Again, so things can flourish and thrive and grow and come to life. Our creation story is all about life and light. Day four. He puts lights in the sky, sun, moon, and stars. The brighter light to guide us by day and the dimmer light to guide us by night. The stars are also there to indicate seasons and appointed times is what Genesis 1 tells us. Again, it's all about light and life. God begins to create life and vegetation and animals and he says be fruitful and multiply right we have the animals or the monsters of the seed we have the birds of the air be fruitful and multiply on day five and then on day six we all know this picture god creates man he says in our image and after our likeness he created them male and female he created them. So what started off as this big blob, of, that's the technical term, blob, of nothingness and darkness and gloom, light and space and life begins to flourish and grow. And he says, be fruitful, multiply. And then God does something that might surprise us. 
God rests. So one of the things I want to ask before we move on is, is God tired? Right? He's, done, he's done all this work. It's actually one of the things that get Jesus in trouble in the Gospel of John, which we're not going to talk about this morning, but because Jesus says God is working and he continues to work and people got upset. And they said, no, God stopped working on day six. And Jesus says, no, he's still working, right? Is God tired? Does he rest on day seven because he's tired? What does it mean for God to rest? What does that even mean? God rests because his image is there. Now think about this. So God has been creating life and light and space for flourishing and abundance. Be fruitful, multiply. And then he puts his image there. The last thing he does in that story is he puts his image in his creation like a temple. So sometimes in the ancient world, people would build temples and they'd take an image of their God and they would stick it inside the temple. And that image was supposed to represent God and in some ways kind of like do the work of God. Kind of, sort of. Ancient idols were a hard thing to, to, to figure out exactly what they thought those things did. Our Bible tells us they did nothing but collect dust. But... It's hard to figure out exactly what they did. God builds this temple. And he rests in his temple because he can take residence. So it's kind of like, have you ever built a house? Have you ever moved into a house? (laughs) All right. You don't really move in until everything's in place, right? You don't feel like you've really moved in. And sometimes you're actually sleeping there, but you still got stuff in boxes in the garage and the bed's not set up and the mattress on the floor. And you say, are you moved in? And your friend's like, hey, you finally moved in? You're like, well, <laughs> kind of, right? Sort of kind of moved in, but I've got to put the bed together. I've got to get the dishes put in place. You're like, I'm not really moved in. But once everything is set up, then you can move in. When God rests, he's moving in. He's taking residence. His work is done, but his image is there. To continue the work he had started. You don't believe me, I can tell. (laughs) Then God said, let us make humans in our image, according to our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the air, and over the cattle, and over all the wild animals of the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps upon the earth. Sometimes people like to debate about what does it mean to be made in the image of God. I think Genesis tells us what this is supposed to mean. It's the means that all the stuff that God was in charge of, he put his image there and says, you're in charge of all this stuff I made now. This is you now. I can rest. You are here. Continue the work. Care for what I've created. It's all under your control, so to speak. It's all under your care. All of it's under your control. Care. So God created humans in his image. In the image of God, he created them, male and female. He created them. Every single one of us is made in the image of God. There have been some crazy theories throughout church history where it said that women were not created in the image of God. They needed a man so that they could be the image of God. I think that's a silly doctrine. But we had it. And if you didn't believe that doctrine back in the day, you were a heretic. Male and female, he created them. Both in the image of God. Both of them. God blessed them and said to them, Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the air and over every living thing that moves upon the earth. God saw everything that he had made and indeed it was very good. So every other day, things were good. But when he makes man... It's very good. Hey, how are things coming along? You're moving into your house. Pretty good. Next day, all still going pretty good. Are you moved in? It's very good. Right? No boxes left in the garage. Every piece of furniture is back in place where it's supposed to be. We are fully moved in. No, it's very good. It's very, very good. And there was evening and there was morning the sixth day. Thus the heavens and the earth were finished, 
and all their multitude. On the sixth day, God finished the work that he had done, and he rested on the seventh day from all the work that he had done. So God blessed the seventh day and hallowed it because it was on it God rested from all the work that he had done in creation. Now, I hope you're hanging with me because all of this stuff has to do, you might be thinking, why, if you're talking about walking in the light, isn't that like a first John passage? Why are you talking about Genesis? Because John talks about Genesis. He will say something like, this is the command you had from the beginning. So that tells me I have to understand what's happening in the beginning to understand the command that I've had from the beginning. Because in the beginning, God saw darkness and he drove it out with his light. And he created space for flourishing and love. And I think that maybe that's what we're supposed to do too. In fact, we are his image. That is our job. That is our job. God can rest because his image is here. He's all moved in. Because you are here. Now that might sound really, really scary. God can rest because I am here. Like, whoa, well, I don't know, all right? I didn't write the story. God rests because his image is there. As Christians, as people of God, we have a high, high, high responsibility to have no darkness. No darkness. Let's read from 1 John. We'll spend the rest of our time in 1 John. This is the message we have heard from him and proclaim to you, that God is light, and in him there is no darkness at all. No darkness. For whatever reason, as I've been studying this, that, those two words have stuck out to me. Can I say that as an image bearer of God? Can I say that in me there is no darkness? No, I can't. I don't have this passage in here, but later on he'll say, if you say you have no sin, the truth's not in you. So I'm not saying that I have no darkness, but that's a goal. As a child of God, the goal for me is to have no darkness. And what I mean by that is, is to create no darkness in the life of the people around me and the people that I care about. You, my family, people I interact with, to create no darkness. But we all know that that's not always true. It's not always true. If we say that we have fellowship with him while we are walking in darkness, we lie and do not do what is true. We lie and we don't do what is true. If we're like, oh, I'm walking in the light, but we're walking in darkness. What does it mean to walk in light? And what does it mean to walk in darkness? It sounds like I should really be focused on avoiding that latter part, right? Walking in darkness. I don't want to lie and not do what is true. I want to be about truth. I want to be about honesty. I want to be about life and light. Not walk in darkness. Beloved, I am writing you no new commandment, but an old commandment that you have had from the beginning. The old commandment is the word that you have heard. Yet I am writing you a new commandment that is true in him, and in you, because the darkness is passing away, and the true light is already shining. Whoever says, I am in the light, while hating a brother or sister, is still in the darkness. So remember the question, what does it mean to walk in darkness? It means you do not love. 
the core of Christianity, the core of who we are when we wake up in the morning and we say, either verbally or in our head, I am a Christian, I am a child of God. What it means is that I must wake up every single day and love my brother and my sister. I have to love the people around myself. And all around Jesus, people are always coming to him and saying, well, what about this? And what about that? I want a loophole. I want a way out. Do I have to love that person? What if they're my enemy? What if they're a Roman? What if, what if, what if, what if? Who's my brother? Give me an escape route, please, Jesus. And Jesus says, there is no escape route. If you want to walk in light, if you want to enter through the narrow gate, then even your enemies will receive your love. Now, for those of you who've been here for a while, you know, like, man, he keeps saying the same thing over and over and over again. I can't help it. It's all over the place in scripture. It is all over the place. And you know, part of what our problem is, we will hate someone, but we will give our hate another name. So we don't say that we hate them. But in our heart of hearts, we wish them the worst. Oh, but I'm walking in the light. When's the last time you saw me miss church? I never miss church. I'm walking in the light. There are some awful people who have never missed church. Whoever loves, we read this passage last week, whoever loves is born of God. Whoever loves, whoever loves a brother or sister abides in light. That's how you know you're walking in light is when you are loving. Sometimes we need to swallow our pride. No, not just sometimes, a lot. Because our pride gets in the way of our love. Now look, if you're having some sort of struggle, I'm not saying stop coming to church until you get it all figured out. No, that's keep coming. But don't pretend you don't have a problem. When we can't love our own family members, right? Our own flesh and our own blood, we don't talk to them. We don't know what's going on in their life and we don't care. Because 25 years ago, they said something that hurt your feelings. I get it, they shouldn't have said it. You've done and said things you shouldn't have said or done either. And what do you want from people? What do you want from people when you've wronged them? You want them to forgive you. They didn't come out the right way. I was in a bad spot. I did the wrong thing. I'm so sorry. I didn't know it was going to hurt you. Or I actually, I knew and I realized I'm just, I've got some darkness in me. I just, I want you to love me despite me. And when they do, they are acting like God in your life. I don't have this passage up here because it just came to me. But remember Jacob and Esau? When they're arguing, it's at the it's kind of like the very end of their story, so to speak. And they have this long, drawn-out saga where Jacob has just mistreated his brother seven ways a Sunday. I mean, he's just, he's just not a nice guy. And Esau seems like he's kind of not all that intelligent when you read through the stories. Like, he keeps tricking you over and over and over again. Right? To the point where Jacob's name, he's the trickster. That, that's who he is. And at the end, when they're about to come back and meet one another again, Jacob is scared to death because Esau has built up quite a force of people. And Jacob says, I've wronged him so many ways. If he sees me, he's probably going to kill me and then take everything I own. This is going to be awful. And he tries to appease his brother. He tries to send him these wagons full of goods to make him happy. So when he finally shows up to where Jacob is, Esau will be happy with him. 
And Esau says, I don't, I don't need your stuff. God's been blessing my life. And scripture says, it was as if Jacob saw the face of God. When we forgive the people in our lives, I'm not saying you haven't been wrong. You have. That's why we forgive. You don't forgive things that have never happened. <laughs> right? You can only forgive and show love for something that has happened. And when we do it, people see God. Or John will say, God's love and God abides in that love. Whoever loves a brother or sister abides in light. And in such a person there is no cause for stumbling. But whoever hates a brother or sister is in the darkness, walks in the darkness, and does not know the way to go because the darkness has brought on blindness. Remember a few weeks ago I talked about when I was a kid and I got lost in my own bedroom? Remember? And I was trying to find the light switch, but I'd slept in my bed the wrong direction. I woke up and everything in my room was disoriented. For those of you who weren't there, I grew up and lived in a basement, no windows. I, well, it wasn't a dungeon. My parents treated me all right, but my bedroom had no windows. And I woke up, I grew up in Ohio, we had basements, there was zero light coming in that room, and I was completely disoriented. I was walking around in the light, and I was blind because it was so dark in there. That's what hate does to us. You will walk through, the, through your life in the light of day, but in complete darkness. Why? Is it because I didn't get all my doctrines correct? No. It's because we didn't love. It's because we didn't love. Chapter 3. For this is the message you have heard from the beginning. That we should love one another. We know that we have passed from death to life because we love our brothers and sisters Whoever does not love abides in death. Sometimes it's easy to read those passages and just keep, keep on going. Right? Abides in death, yeah, yeah, abides in death, walk in life, da-da-da, da-da-da. You, you can't da-da-da through this stuff. The church that John is writing to is going through a lot, a lot of problems. People leaving the church, people trying to tear the church apart. And his message to them is to love. Whoever does not love abides in death. Or you could say abides in a creation where there is no life. Just chaotic waters and darkness. Whoever does not love abides in death. That doesn't sound like a pleasant place to live. Right? When I ask you, have you ever moved into a place? And like, yeah, we've all moved into places. Was that place called death? It could be. If it's not a place of love. It could be. We know love by this. How do I know I'm loving right? That he laid down his life for us. And we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers and sisters. You know, for all the fissures and fractures within Christianity, it seems like we never split over stuff like this. Am I loving enough? We'll split over carpet because the rich people got to pick the carpet for the church and the poor people didn't have a say and we'll split. And there is concern there if that's how the church operates. But our primary concern should be do we love each other? Do we love each other? There are certain people who have impacted my life not by what they believe, but by what they did. 
You guys have heard me talk about this person before, but it's been a while, so just pretend it's a new story. When I was living in Peru and I had food poisoning and I was in the hospital, there was a guy. Now, for those of you who know me, you know I'm not the most conservatively minded person in the world. So me and Hippolito, we had problems because he read scripture like a rule book and I didn't. So he had all these strict rules and guidelines and, and I didn't have them. So we had some conflict there and he was afraid I'd bring my way of thinking to his people. Legit fear. I get it. But man, when I, was in, when I was sick in the hospital, you know who the first person was that came to see me? Hippolito. There he was. Because he loved me. And I'll never forget that. His love for me was greater than our disagreement. He was walking in the light. He was walking in the light. Are we loving each other? Are we walking in the light? We have the perfect example for this, and his name is Jesus. How much do we love the people around us? Well, how much did Jesus love you? Go and do likewise. Verse 17, how does God's love abide in anyone who has the world's goods and sees a brother or sister in need and yet refuses to help? Refuses to help. I referenced this last week. Be warm and well fed, brother. But you don't give them anything to stay warm or to be well fed. Your sentiments are of no use. Especially if all you have to do is go home and get him some clothes and some food. Hey, now look, you're warm and well fed. This is why we exist. This is why we're here. This is what it means to say, I am a Christian. I am a Christian. Little children, let us love not in word or speech, but in deed and truth. You know, they say you don't, you don't trust a person based on what they say. You trust a person based on what they do. Because it's very easy to say, oh yeah, this or that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But will they actually do it? And so when we say, yeah, 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 I love my family. I love my church. I love the people that I work with. I love. It has to be more than something you say. It has to be something that we do. Love is a verb. Love is just, it's not just a feeling that you get. If it were a feeling, I would only love sporadically and only certain people. If it was all just a feeling, Love is a verb that's supposed to be practiced with everyone. Jesus will say it like this. He'll say things like, it's easy to love people who agree with you. It's easy to love people who are like you, for people who agree with everything that you agree with. It's easy to love them. He says, everybody does that. He'll say, even pagans and tax collectors they do that. You can imagine Matthew's face like, huh? Me? Like, yeah, everybody does that. The harder thing to do is to love the people around you who don't agree with you. But that's how you know whether or not you're a follower of Jesus. Whether you're doing it right. And this is his commandment that we should believe in the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and love one another. Because if you say that you believe that Jesus Christ is your Lord and your Savior, all you need to do is look at a cross to figure out how you're supposed to live the rest of your life. You are not saved by good deeds, but you are saved for good deeds. Jesus 
just as he commanded us. Chapter 4. This is a quick run through the, God, for the, through the first epistle of John. Beloved, let us love one another. Man, it's almost like he wants to get a point across. He keeps saying the same thing over and over again. Let us love one another because love is from God and everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God for God is love. Now, if we were a phenomenal four-part singing church, there's a perfect song we could sing based on this passage. But we're not. <laughs> it's a really hard song to pull off. I don't want people, and I'm, I'm just saying this as a person, not a preacher, I don't want people to look at Rob Coyle and think, yeah, he says he's a Christian. And that's what the man says. I want them to look at how I live my life, how I treat you, how I treat them, how I treat my family, how I treat the people I disagree with. I want them to then look at my actions and say, he's a Christian. He's a Christian. I don't preach because it's my job. It is my job. Glad to have it. Thank you very much. That's not why I do this. I want to be a Christian, whether I work at a church or not. And I didn't always work at a church as a Christian. I want people to look at my life and say, he loves. He loves. Am I perfect? No. Don't ask anyone close to me, but no. I'm not. I don't have to be. I do have to strive to walk in the light. And when I fall short, God is good and just and faithful to forgive me my sins, just like John says. But my goal is always before me. My goal is always before me. We will always have disagreements with people in church, at a church, always. There's always a different perspective. Sometimes three people come together and they have four perspectives. But the non-negotiable in our walk is we believe in Jesus and we love. Or as Jesus would say, love God, love neighbor. And then he gets that famous question, the loophole question, who's my neighbor? Literally everyone, as my teenage children would say. Literally everyone. Another way to think about it is this. There might be people in your life that are your enemy. They're against you. They don't want the best for you. They aren't walking in light. But you are not their enemy just because they're your enemy. If you are a child of God, you are the enemy of no one. You love everyone. God's love was revealed among us in this way. God sent his only son into the world so that we might live through him. So the same thing that was happening in creation with light and life and abundance and flourishing and multiplying, it's all happening in the Christian life. And just like in Genesis, we are to reflect that life. We are the image and we reflect God into the world. In this is love. Not that we loved God. A lot of people think it starts there. Oh, it starts with us loving God. It can't start there. It always starts with God loving you. But that he loved us and sent his son to be the atoning sacrifice 
for our sins. It starts there. God gives us His love. God gives us His forgiveness. God gives us His mercy and His grace. Go and do likewise. Beloved, since God loved us so much, we also ought to love one another. Side thought, it's hard to imagine what was going on in that church where you'd have to be this repetitive. Didn't he already say this? Yeah, he says it a lot through the first epistle. A lot. No one has ever seen God. If we love one another, God abides in us and his love is perfected in us. Sometimes I think it'd be cool if you could see God, right? Have like your Moses moment on the mountain and he passes before you. Wow, this is amazing. John tells us how to do it. You want to have a cleft in the rock moment? Love the people around you. Because God's presence will be there. God will abide there. It's an interesting, interesting thought. If you want to see God, love. When Esau loved Jacob, Jacob said, I've seen the face of God. Love. Walk. Walkling in the light. Walk in the light. You're not going to do it perfectly. I don't. I don't. Nobody does, but we can help each other. We can help each other by being there for one another and loving each other. Because we all go through dark spots in life, and when we're in our darkest spot, We need someone to walk in the light with us. So let's walk in the light of love together. Amen? Amen.